Thank you for coming here this afternoon. My name is Harold Jacobs. I work at Central Council Tlingit and Haida Indian Tribes of Alaska. My main job is working with repatriation, which is helping return objects from museums. This work involves family trees, history of objects, history of names, songs, and photographs. And I have quite a collection of these at work, and I'm not able to download that much information. So I just brought the family tree list and then a presentation that I did at one of our general assemblies. used to be that you could tell pretty much where someone was from by their Tlingit name. I remember, I thought Harold came in here, but there you are. When your brother Mitchell was talking with my grandpa, my grandpa asked him, knew he lived in Cake, but he asked him what his Tlingit name was. Tangaish. My grandpa said, oh, well, your family's from Huna. And he knew by the name where he came from, what clan he was. Sadly, some of that's being lost because people are using names that don't come from their families or houses, and it's kind of fading away. <coughs> I remember one time talking with, someone in Juneau, about 1993. I had a friend who was not Tlingit, but she had a brother who was part Tlingit, and she said, I have a Kaguan Tan from Taku. And I told him, if you're Kaguan Tan, you're not from Taku. There's no Kaguan Tan clans there. And vice versa, if you're Kaguan Tan, and you're not from Taku. We went back and forth for two and a half hours. I was trying to figure out who his family was and didn't recognize his mother's name, didn't recognize his grandmother's name, and English names.
a bison hunt and wearing a bison coat, probably from interior days before they migrated. Why didn't she ask us? Why does why do some anthropologists just make guesses at these things? There's still people that know these trees. There's still people that know the stories. And even today I've run into that with just guessing instead of asking the source. Turns out that that house, when it was built, it didn't have a doorway in it, a door in it, and they covered the house with cow skins. And a young man made the comment, let's just call it the cow house. And his remark stuck, and that's why they named that house the cow house. But she didn't ask. And there's still a family from that house. I thought that line was actually extinct. I didn't know there were any people left from that house. And I was hoping to have the person. I, I found the family from there. They have their hat, and they still have that Chilkat shirt. And I was trying to get them here to the conference, but they were, they, they just couldn't make it this time. So these names are very important in the, in the lineages. The largest tree that I found, I remember someone had died from Klukwam about seven years ago, and someone called and asked if I could find anything on his family, and they told me his Klingit name. Now that name sure sounds familiar, so I went looking through my notes, and the papers to Louis Shotreach had. And that man's great-grandmother had recorded the tree with an anthropologist around 1930. And there was, with him, his grandchildren, and the ancestors he named, there were 17 generations on that tree, probably going back into the 1400s. I have used these trees in filing repatriation claims and connecting families to the objects that come from their house. I've had people come up to me and say, my dad was your dad's uncle. And I think to myself, where does that come in? I don't know who the person is. One of the claims we had is a wolf house claim here. It's on five objects and they were approved to come back. But someone from uh, another community who doesn't even have a house here filed a counterclaim. And for a year those hats have been ha held up. Those hats would be at this conference today. But when you make fabricated claims, fabricated family trees, fabricated history, this is what happens. You need to know your history. When I was growing up here, I grew up two houses away from my grandparents. All they ever spoke mainly was clunket in the house. I heard it all the time. I heard my dad speak it and his brothers. My mom couldn't. And one day when I was, when our dance group was dancing, it was actually the song Shawat Khan when they were singing it, and I sat there and I thought, hmm, I understand the words. So I listened closer, and how about that? I do understand it. I don't know how it stuck, but it did. And I'd hear these stories about the killer whale house in Angoon and the beaver house, and my mind would picture these great big empty houses, big rooms and artifacts maybe sitting there. My mind would just wander off dreaming about these. I'd hear people's names and grandfather's names and Cotlain was one, my great grandfather's name. Then I started going to Angoon when I was in high school and hearing these names and family trees and then more here. And things where I kind of fit together like puzzles when you look at someone and you can see their family tree and who they're connected to and that's a really important part not only in the repatriation of the objects but when the objects come back and how to address the people who are connected to the objects.
I don't like misinformation. I don't like fabricated history. I don't like revisionist history. There's no need to say my clan is better than yours, my clan is bigger than yours. We're never more than who our grandfathers are. We rely on our grandfathers. And we do this not for us, but for our grandchildren. It's never about us, me, myself, I, the Mimi syndrome. This is why I say repatriation is like a minefield, because when an object comes back, it's mine, mine, that's supposed to be mine, mine, mine. Oh yeah, how are you connected to the object? One of these hats, I wish Andy Gamble was in here. That hat, the origin of the hat, and the names associated with it are still intact within his family, and it's only his family that has the two names associated with the hat and his lineage. But still, another group comes in and fabricates their own story for it and stops it. So where is the connection? These names connect us to each other. These names connect us to objects. Some names are from events. in our histories, in many things that have happened. This is one of the big trees that I have too that probably goes into the 1600s or 1500s. I remember when I looked at this one, this is I'll use Ishmael's tree. Is Ishmael in here? Ah, I have wound up with that same tree again. No, I can't make it any larger. There it is. One of the hats we have claimed is actually cleared to come back, but the two clowns wanted to keep them to coming back together. If you can figure out the generations of these, This is Ishmael's grandfather, Ishmael's grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother. And this probably goes back into the 1700s, but this man here had a raven hat that came from Dry Bay, then they brought it to Sitka, and that has been approved for return. And I used this tree also to help in the reclaiming of that hat to get it returned. I looked at a name here. It was always intriguing to me what this name was here, this one, Yayi Tau Dostain, because to me it sounded like that looking around, right? This tree was recorded by Amelia Cameron. She was about a hundred when she died in 1947. And she had a phenomenal memory. How far back she could go in this tree and who the brothers and sisters were and the grandparents and their siblings and those grandparents and the other siblings. An um, anthropologist named Ronald Olson recorded in Klawak, Sitka, and Klukwan. And he had notes on these names. And Yayi Taudushkain came from when the Kiksadi were having a party and they were looking through the crowd to see who to give the gifts to. So 
So the knowing your tree and history, my grandmother had an older brother. She had a younger brother, and their mother died when she was about eight. And then her grand, her father married someone from Sitka who already had two children, and then they had five more children. But somehow the lines got clouded, and I've heard people try to connect us as though we're different clans, but because of the different marriages, I knew that wasn't right, and I'd tell them, and connecting the names to an object helps a lot. When I was working on family trees, I could see so many connections and working on repatriation, hearing the name of a person who had an object and knowing their lineages. And I heard so many stories when I was growing up my dad and my grandmother, stories of people who were connected to different houses and the names of houses and things I probably shouldn't have heard, like who was descended from slaves or whatever like that. And I kept some of that to myself. I just think about it. And then when I started talking about these trees and who people were connected to, I know, especially here, someone would argue with me and in public, and insulting, and in degrading, I said, whatever, I know what I'm talking about, and I just kept it to myself. But when I went to the University of California Berkeley Library at the Bancroft Library, I came across these notes talking about these very family trees, and the things that I heard growing up, and the connections, and who people were, were all recorded in those notes in the 1930s. So I was right, and this old man who was trying to put me down was wrong. Was I smug? Of course I was. <laughs> Still am. <laughs> I'm going to use this PowerPoint. This is what I presented at the 2009 General Assembly in Juneau on how we can use these. I wish I could make this bigger. Can that be pulled back some? This? Nobody's in here. I can't get much bigger than that. I had a that help? I had a friend giving a presentation on the ferry one time, and he, on the ferry, he had 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, like that on the ferry. And he said what this is, is the timeline of what supposedly the clink could have been in this area of, let's use the timeline of 12,000 years. And every minute is is what? One thousand years. Five hundred. So all you ever hear about from most people is maybe the last minute of our timeline. But our names and our History and houses go back into time immemorial, some for thousands of years, telling of the Ice Age and the Flood. This is my balancing act. <laughs> when I work on repatriation, family trees, clan history stories and names, songs, photographs, memorial calendars, clink-up month calendars. And this is what I use for 
not only helping people with family trees and connections and preserving songs like songs. I had some that were taken off of a tape that was recorded in 1947 here in Sitka. Someone gave me a copy of it. He played it once and then he played it through again and recorded it to digitize it. And the third time he tried to play it, the tape fell apart. But I was able to revive four songs off of that tape and they would have been lost if he hadn't done the digitizing. <coughs> songs that were on the Swanton tapes, I was able to find about ten in intact songs and we've revived three of those songs so far in ceremonial parties. We do our visits to museums to talk about these objects. How many were at the presentation last night at the Nakahiri? These are some of the things that they talked about. And all of these, we don't need all this information, but every bit of information that we can gather to help prove a claim helps. Sometimes we have photographs, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we have family trees, we don't. Whatever will fit together to help prove our claim and right to possession. At one museum, the museum brought the objects out and I asked them something in Clinkett and George said, I sang the song for an object. Then I put the drum on the table. And what I asked them was, now sing your song for it. And George told him that. He said, he sang their song, now they want to hear your song. Of course, the museum didn't have a song for the object. And the uh, curator started crying. <laughs> <laughs> bringing these objects back, it's not just going in and grabbing an object and bringing it back and putting it into use. To us, I guess you could say they've been hurt or abused by being removed from us. We need to do ceremonies to bring them back. We just don't bring them in and slip them under the radar. We, Unless they're shaman objects, which we don't care to handle, and we will take a non-native with us to pick them up. We do a ceremony involving the clans that are the owners. We turn them over to the person who signed for the objects and we turn them over in public so they can see them being returned. One time I wrote a claim and it took two weeks for the museum to approve it and by that summer the object was back. That was a kick study hat that Ray Wilson is now the caretaker of. It's in the museum on loan in Juneau. But we have claims that have been pending since 1997. I take the right team, okay? These are some of the things we've done at museums and connecting people who are related to the objects, like this here is Andy Gamble wearing the eagle hat from his house. But someone from another house has decided that he wants it and is claiming it. But it's not from his house. And this raven hat that Herman's wearing, that's approved to come back, but it, they're not coming back until they all come back together. We start off with these people that were connected to other objects in La Junta, Colorado. We took a group down there to pick up a Chilkat blanket and a shaman object, which we didn't bring out here. We just kept that in the box. We work well with museum staff, and the museum staff have been learning these, and it's amazing that some museum staff even have been learning lineages to objects, because we've been teaching them that, showing, telling them who the people are that are connected to them, and they learn this through reading the claims as well. But as I've been trying to do for the past nine years, when We do these claims, we've told the museums where possible. We can write about this. We can sit and discuss it with you. We can tell you the families. 
and the names involved, but until you come to our country and see these names, see these objects in use for the for what they were intended to be used for and how they were intended to be used and the families connected to them, you won't understand it. You have to see them in motion. Seeing an object in a case is like looking at a dead body in a casket. They have to have life in them. And just to tell you, these are all the objects that were approved by repatriation for, for return but are being held up by a false claim. All of these. I don't know how to get around that. We've been fighting that for four years on one object and over a year on these. One of the claims we had was off the Swanton tapes when I gave the family tree. I also found the song for the Eagle Hat on the Swanton tapes and transcribed that, and that was revived in 2004. Clan hats with names connected to them. The Kiksari Peace Hat connected to Shkavos Yesh and the Killer Whale Hat connected to Kushtahin my mom's grand uncle who had the wolf hat. Anachutz had a claim in on this sea monster hat in the upper left. He even had the name Anachutz in there and said head chief of the Sitka tribe, which is the name Andy Gamble has. And at that same time, he also had a counterclaim on this hat by the same group holding up these other hats. I don't care. It's public information. People need to know that there's false information being used to hold up things. Another group wrote and said, that's supposed to belong to us. The museum wrote back and had, they had Andy's family tree and they had the information on the hat and who it was collected fr from. And the museum pretty much said, oh, we know who he is and the name is, who are you? And the name did come, the hat did come back. I told you I've had arguments with people on repatriation and lineages and clan histories. About four years ago, I came home. I lived in a trailer park and there was a note in the door. It was an ID card. It was from the FBI. Hmm, wonder what they want. So I called them in the morning and uh, FBI agent said, well, we had a report from Sitka that the sea monster hat that was repatriated was missing and they thought you sold it. So I told him the history of the hat and where it was and who the caretaker was, the whole process and the museums verified it. But to me, that just showed me that this, that some people are capable of stooping to anything when they disagree with you. I had all the information to back it up, but you think it's an easy job, it's not. I heard the, I heard one of the clan leaders say if his job was an elected position, he had never run for it. <laughs> Using family names and histories and lineages brought back all of these hats. The hats are the most important object a clan could have. And we're still working on the hats. Other headdresses. And this one here, these two were repatriated on the left. But this one, a private collector had it. And he called to tell me about another headdress that was being returned. A woman wanted to return it. So I asked him, do you still have this swan headdress? He said, yeah. He laughed. Two days later, he called me back and said, well, I think I've had that long enough in my collection. I want to return it. Where can I get it to? 
So then I started making some phone calls and threw clinket names and lineages again, even though the headdress was bought from someone on Klokwan, the names and the lineages connected it to Sitka. And it's back in their possession. It might be out tonight when the group is dancing. I hope it is. The dagger on the right was out. This was made before European contact times. My grandmother used to know the name of all the caretakers. There were eight of them before her. But the family tree and the names, including the name of the man, the three men who had it before her was also my father's name and we used that in the repatriation claim as well as this photo. This man in the photo, his name was Kuskus Khan. I wish I had a pointer. There's the dagger right there. This hedge rush was repatriated and this one and all three of the <laughs> objects are here today. Family names and lineages connected also to these objects in this photo that were also repatriated. Not only family names, but historical photographs. How many of you knew Al Perkins here in Sitka? And this is his grandfather, Al Perkins, wearing the shirt. And it went to my great-grandfather, John Paul. It got used as a payment for a death, but before it was buried with somebody, the man's mother took it. My grandmother was supposed to marry someone else, and he drowned while fishing with his future father-in-law, my great-grandfather, and he waited for his clan to help him to pay for that. Because even if someone is, when someone's working with you, if the death is an accident, you have to pay for it. When you break something, you have to pay for it. The payment for a death is ka, called Ka Na Wu Wei Di, and that's what they used it for. But it surfaced again after about 20 years, and my grandmother bought it and gave it back to her father's people, which was my grandfather. And we told this whole history and the claim and all the names connected in his family tree. No one else could prove that. There's some others from his house, but they don't have the family tree or the names to connect them to this object. And either the, that object or the herring rock blanket up above, which was repatriated in 2003, or the Chief Shakes blanket that was repatriated in 2007. We took the blanket back to Wrangell in 2008, and that was brought out in a ceremony in Wrangell. Many clans and clan leaders showed up for this party, the first one that was held there in 68 years. Some objects that had been at the party in 1904, 1940 when Chief Shakes the seventh received that title were also brought out in 1998. When we hear these names, like the man holding the Chief Shakes killer whale hat upside down, we were repeating the names of the clans of our, of our clan, the ancestors, who our uncles were, our grand uncles, our aunts, our maternal grandmothers all of them connecting us to these objects on the father's side, on the mother's side. I think about these people that knew these lineages and wonder, often wonder what it would be like to be in a clinket speaking world and not hear any English. Wouldn't that be nice? And what's going to become of us? This was 1904, 108 years ago. And the other picture was taken in 2007 at my dad's memorial party. Those, the hat on the right and the one in front were repatriated. The one in front is the one that 
they did the presentation on of the 3D replication. Now, I'll give you an example of how this is. This is my great grandfather, John Paul, Hotline. His wife was Oskin, was Kute, Mary, whose father is Dikyesh Nau. Dikyesh Nau's wife was Oskin, whose father was Kichnask, Killis New Jake. His wife's name was Guk. Killis New Jake's mother was Kanigwek. We were able to get this headdress back and this headdress back. These two are brothers. This is George Johnson, Kashakau, Sam Johnson, Ayok. Their mother was Tin, who was a sister to Dick Yesh Nawu from the Raven House. By the way, that's that Chilkat shirt again. They wound up in the Haida section in the National Museum of the American Indian. And I, I couldn't figure out why they were put in there. Someone else told me, oh, museums don't keep good track of things. Now, the NMAI may have had that problem, but then I was told by one of our family members from the same branch that Dikyesh Nawu had three wives and his last wife was Haida. And apparently the, when he died, his Haida wife took all those objects back with her including one of the hats here. I did, when I was there in 2004, I jokingly said, let me look in the Haida section again just to see if you have Tlingit objects in there. And we all laughed. I walked in there and I looked and there was that hat from Mangoon again. I said, wow, I was just joking. But the family trees showed the lineages, so showed the connections to these objects. My grandmother and Mary John gave me the ID on the on these photos, and all of these people still have descendants in Angoon today. And some of these objects are have been repatriated, including the sleeping giant, the hawk headdress, the beaver staff. This is under claim. The first object to be come back was this dragonfly headdress in 1985. They hadn't even done repatriation. There was no such thing as an egg pearl law then. The little guy wearing the hat there is Armando Diasis. He was he and his two brothers were given the names of Archie Bell. Archie Bell was a brother to my great grandmother and Archie Bell's father is Dickie Snawu. Dickie Snawu married that hat and this hat. And we use that in the information on the claims. Armando and his brothers were given three of the names of Archie Bell. Ar Armando's name is Nosk. And right now we've had the approval to return 35 shaman objects from the grave of Nosk, who Armando was named after, who Archie Bell was named after. And we're going to um, be using him and my cousin named Nosk to retrieve these objects. They won't be handling. We don't handle shaman objects. We'll take a non-native person to retrieve these. But these names all connect us to these objects so incredibly in our family trees and grandfathers. And I'll, I'll talk something about my grandfather's shirt. in the middle there. My grandmother sold some objects in 1974, but my grandfather wouldn't sell the shirt. He thought maybe he could be buried in it. And then I, in, on Alaska Day in 1974, 1975, they were getting ready for the Alaska Day Parade, and my brother said, go ask Grandpa if you can use his Chilkat shirt. I went down there and I asked my grandpa, Mark, he's standing there wearing the shirt in the lower left in the color photo. I asked him if I could use the shirt and he almost started crying. He had just sold the shirt. He had found out he had cancer 
and he asked someone for help and with money and he couldn't get it so he sold it to get money to travel down for treatment but we knew the history of the shirt from when it arrived in Angoon to Yet Qinatia and went to Kwas Ish and then to Kotlin. Then I got transferred in that payment for her death and then back to my grandfather. So it was a pretty clear cut case of the family tree and who it belonged to. But where in your grandfather's at ooh really stirs emotions in you? when you can put on something your grandfather had. Just last night I was holding an object I thought I'd never see again and as I held it I could hear the old man's voice and picture him laughing and could picture him dancing. I could hear him speaking clink it. And so I never got to use my grandfather's at ooh, it was gone. But I could still hear his name and then when it came back I could hear my grandpa again. How many of you knew my dad? See, I always tell people my dad looked just like his dad, unless he was mad, then he looked like his mom. <laughs> <laughs> Sergey showed this earlier, and some of the hats that are being claimed are actually in this photo. But this woman here is from Angoon. <coughs> And we used her image and lineage to connect them to this headdress that was repatriated in 2003. Now one that we picked up when we were in Greeley. When someone, we were picking up a, the bear pole for Mangoon and that was the same clan that owned this headdress. So we flew the person from the Beloit College to bring the headdress to transfer it at the same time. Sergei had this photo up. The gravestone is for Kani Goik, who was the mother of my great-great-great-grandfather, Kilish Najik. This is one of my favorite sayings. Which can be translated as our atu, as we speak forth the name or the name of it, it's as if our maternal uncles are standing with us and that their voices will once again be heard. Or when these objects make an appearance in public, the voices of all those that wore them before are heard. And I mentioned that to Mike yesterday about his uncle's hat that he had here. His uncle, I think his name was Jana Stuck, wasn't it? Eli. Eli yeah. So our lineages tell our history. They are alive with the people that we name our own descendants after. And all these objects that you saw out You can hear the names of the people who used to wear, wear them before. You can, s I can see their lineages. I can see their names. I can hear their voices. When you say a Clinket name, and I think about the person I used to hear when I started going to Angoon in 1980, the clan leaders all sitting at the head table there. I can still picture the tables filled around with all of them sitting there. And Cyril's the only one left. Cyril is 90 this year. When Cyril, Cyril told me that when he was born, the old man that had the beaver hat that he's wearing came to his mother and asked, is that a boy child? And he, she said, yeah. And he said, I want him to have my name so people, when they see him going by, they will remember me. the names to the houses that connect us to the houses, that connect us to these histories. 
my father's house is up in the top there. When I see that, I see the name of the man who made it, Yes Naomu, my great great grandfather. And to my father's voice and the names he used to talk about of the people who lived in them. This one on the the left is from George's clan. That's one of the most spectacular house fronts I've ever seen. The Ghana Kha. Can you say something about Ghana Kha, George? Do you feel like saying anything? Can you say anything about it? Or just go through the pictures? <laughs> The screen on the lower right is a screen from my clan. Unfortunately, it appears that it has been lost. I have no idea where that screen is. But I had it reproduced, painted on the rim of a hat that wraps around the whole hat. So we could preserve the screen in that fashion. Anyway, these are the Sitka houses, Sitka clan houses. And all of them, sometimes they share names, sometimes a house splits off from a house, and that house continues to retain the names of the former house that branched off of, and they also create their own names. Sitka once had 42 clan houses. It was the largest of the villages. This was, I use my dad's family a lot because I just can, it, it's just in my mind all the time. He had, he has the dagger, his mother before him, before her was her uncle, Pete Kanosh on the bottom, Bob Sam's grandfather, and then his clan brother, who is my grandma's true uncle, Archie Bell. And Archie Bell's uncle was supposed to have it, but he died before he could get it, so his grandmother's brother, Kush Dahin, had that, which is a name all four of these men had that we were able to use also in the claim. Hashuka is a term that refers to our past, our present, and our future. <coughs> and I hope we can all work on these names. I'm happy to help people with names and houses. Someone today came, yesterday came to me and asked me about her family. And she, when she told me who her grandmother was, I was able to tell her what house she was from here in Sitka. One time I needed help with a family tree, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. 
Sometimes maybe I ask too many questions. My dad would get mad at me when I was a teenager. Don't ask him those things. That's none of your business. But I asked anyway, and I kept asking. How many of you grew up around old clinkout women? I am surprised that those of us who did that we don't start off every sentence with, yeah, because <laughs> that's the way they always started off. <laughs> I asked a woman one time for help with a family tree, and she was really helpful. She had it right off the top of her head and snapped out the names, and I was trying to write them down as fast as she could, coming down to a great-grandchild who connected in her tree. And when we got done, I said, thank you. And she said, how much are you going to pay me for this? I get paid for my work. I stopped myself because I almost said, I'll pay you what you paid for it. I never, ever asked her again for any other information because I didn't want to get put in that. The only way I get paid for any of this is with my job and preserving this. Don't give me money. Don't offer me money. I get paid at work. I will pass this on as much as I can. If you want family trees, I'll give you family trees. If you want songs from your clan and I have the words, I'll give that to you. Pictures of things from your clan. Any way to preserve this. I look at these and when I think about repatriation, I look at some of these photos of people from Huna, Angoon, Sitka, other communities who died in the early 70s that were still around when some of these objects were sold and the names they had. And often wonder what would it be like if that law had been passed when they were still alive. And I bet there wouldn't have been any the fighting that we have going on today or the made up history because those guys didn't make up their history they knew their history I asked a woman for a story one time on the ferry at first she didn't want to tell me she kind of turned from me then she turned back faced me straight in the chair and said I'm going to tell you the history the way my uncle told me and the way his uncle told him and the way his uncle told him because my uncle said, if you change any words or anything in the story, that's what's going to be passed on. I had a white friend in Juneau one time ask me about oral history. He said, how do you know your oral, oral history is true? I said, that's just the way our history is. It's been passed down from one person to another. She said, but how do you know it's true? I said, what do you mean? She said, you Indians can't get a story right from one day to the next in talking about something. Moccasin Telegraph, you know. <laughs> but I hope this has been a helpful presentation and talking about how we still have a lot of this intact and where we can get information and how we can use it to keep our lineages alive, our houses alive. Even if your house is gone, your lineage is still alive. Your names are intact. And these objects, all these objects that still have their names and voices resonating in them. Our elders that are here teaching us, some of the clan leaders, most, some of, most of them clan leaders on the stage today, and passing on to the next generation. So well, some of you traveled here today, and I, this is what Cyril started off the prayer with once. Which pretty much means, let's get in the boat and go to another town and see what we can learn. So I hope you were able to get something out of this by coming here to town today. I thank you for coming here. If you have any questions and ask me questions, I'll try to answer. I won't charge you for it. <laughs> Harold? Could you tell them on time, what do you
There's many. There's a number of different ways that happens. One place you need a place to live. <laughs> but the family would get together and build the house and decide who the caretaker would be. Sometimes they named it after an event in the clan, like the Kaguantan, when they built their house. I'm going to write the, to say this the way Louis Shotridge wrote it. Louis Shotridge has some very good notes on origins. He's a little too much slanted to his clan sometimes, but he talked about how when they were building their house and the smudge pots to keep the bugs away were left burning, and overnight it burned the timbers on the house. And they used those timbers anyway, and that's where they built Kawagane Hit, and they became Kawagane Hitton, the Kawantan. And then other house groups split off from another, sometimes because of arguments or quarrels, and they, like in my dad's group, the main house, the Killer Whale House, one lineage in the house couldn't control the Killer Whale dagger, they wanted it. And when they couldn't control it, they got mad and split off and built another house. And there were already two houses there, killer whale houses, and then the other one was built. And they kept referring to the killer whales over there, making fun of them and deriding them. And that's where the name Cleokit came from. The other killer whales, the yonder killer whales, those over there. So that it depends on the situation, like the one I mentioned earlier about the cow house and when it was built and they didn't have the... Uh-oh. What's it doing? It says it's dumping the memory here. It's not my computer. But somebody's losing their memory. Overflow groups like my grandfather's house and the I always wondered where the name Needlefish House came from as my grandfather's house and according to Louis Shotridge that was the I Don't know why I never asked my grandpa that I had to read it in an anthropologist notes <laughs> He said it was because that was the first run of fish that Raven brought into the rivers and uh, before all the salmon and other fish show up, the first run of fish are the needlefish. And then after that, the hooligan. Then after that, the salmon runs start. And they split off into the Raven House, and then there was another house group that split off. Kichnoth, Killis Nujik, split off from that house, and they said his strength was like steel. So they called that house the Steel House. And again, another house got too big in the clan, and was noisy and packed and loud and they built another house next to it and they said it was as quiet as spring raw spring water and that name stuck so they call it Goon Hit the freshwater spring house so it's just dividing houses and branching off into other groups sometimes peaceful splits sometimes not so peaceful peaceful can I buy a vowel <laughs> not so peaceful splits but there are many various ways that houses came into being. Who took what? In this day and age, like uh, Dirk said all our time, I was like, uh, how does one go about the earth and things? Do you have to get the whole thing? Mm, you better get with George on that one. <laughs> Yeah. Andy Gambo kept asking me and Eric about this board that, you know, the advisory board, the national one. And I think, I don't know, I haven't 
interrupting, but you seem to have the impression that if you get somebody from Bringit community on that board, things are going to be great. And I'm not so sure about it, but the seven people, three not, um, I guess three New Zealand people, three Native, American Indian, Native Alaskan, and I forgot who the seventh person is. But I don't think it's going to help that much. In fact, it may make things worse depending on that person's clan membership, community, origin. I don't think, especially, I mean, I know what Andy was, he kept referring to this conflict with Chris Lane, and you also mentioning it. I don't think that board is going to make any difference, and I wonder what you care to comment on that, and what you have dealt with that board. I haven't dealt with that board, and... I don't know how three museum people, three people from other tribes, and a neutral person can decide on a claim from a complex system like we have. It would certainly help, but then that person could wind up being connected to objects being claimed. And it just Yeah. We have nominated Bob Sam to that board several times, but unfortunately he's never been able to get on the board. Maybe that's something this clan conference could do in a general session is say, we want Bob on there and send that to the Negapa Review Committee. <laughs> When I applied for my job at Clinkett and Haida, they asked me if I had 23 applicants for that job. And I remember the questions, but <laughs> when they got done interviewing me, they asked me if I had any questions. Do you have any questions for us? I said, yeah, are you going to hire somebody with a college degree or somebody who knows what they're doing? I got the job. <laughs> so unfortunately, they look at college degrees. The last conference they had here, we brought back some shaman objects, and we wouldn't handle them, but we wanted to show these were some of the things we were working on. So I called some museum staff to handle the objects. And then there was this blanket. They had it sideways and sideways this way and upside down and backwards. I said, the straps are right there. And they couldn't get it right. And I finally said, you know, these are the people with the PhDs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sergey. <laughs> Anything else? One time, my dad's younger brother, they were up at their camp called Watatin in Huna Sound. My uncle was rowing around out there, and he brought back a box. And their grandma asked him where he got it. He pointed to the island offshore there. She told him, take it back out there. That's all she said, take it back there. So he rowed back out there, and the next morning when they got up, that box was floating in front of the camp, right off the beach. And the grandma, their grandma asked my uncle Ernie, did you put that box right back where you found it? And she said, he said, no, I just took it back to the island. 
he made him, she made him take it back to the island and put it back right in the spot where he found it. Position it right back. This is what we try to do with, if we know where an ob object came from, it should be reburied right back where it came from. I know some objects that were returned and put right back in the spot where they came from, but they just can't be placed any old place. But I want to mention this with the shaman objects. In 1995, when we were doing a consultation, we had about six Clinkett speakers doing that consultation, and the museum asked them if they were the last objects, and they said, we have these shaman objects on a tray here. Do you want to look at them? And they said, let us talk to each other first. Nobody jumped up and said, no, no, no. Nobody jumped up and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. They talked about it. They discussed it. And they called the museum staff back in, and they said, if you approach these objects with a good mind and you don't have something wrong inside you, that's okay. Don't mishandle them. Don't use them. But we're the last generation that knows how to handle these objects and how to talk about them. So they did use it that way, but we're still very careful with the objects. And when we picked up seven objects two years ago, I had a friend who's not Clinkett. I asked him to come along to handle the objects. He said, oh, sure, I'll be your token white. <laughs> But when we try to do that, I mentioned it to Cyril, too, and he said that's a good thing to do because those objects, he tapped his chest, he said, those objects still mean something to us. So we're still very careful with how we handle them. We're not scared of them, we just treat them with extra care. Is that it? I remember I shot this as an unusual sheep pattern. And I think I heard you do it one time. I would have the honor of respect to hear you do that. I don't know what his speech pattern was. Looks like that's it. Thank you for coming.